Here we go. Okay, we are on. Uh, par- okay, so I want to go. We're on. We're on page uh, Memhe Gimel. Uh, t- uh, two points from yesterday that I wanted to mention. Um, we talk about that. Uh, remember, we were talking about Oilanu Miyom Hadin Oilanu Miyom Atochecha. Memhe Gimel. Where is this now? Uh, page page two fifty six. Two. Sorry, I lied. Page two fifty two. So remember, we said yesterday, I'm supposed to give him. Yosef el Echov, about uh, 10 lines down. Page 252. Ve Yosef el Echov, Ani Yosef el Echov, Ichoi, Ve Lo Yachlo Echov Lanos, also Kini, follow me, pun of his brothers, couldn't answer because they were so petrified when they saw him, when he revealed his face, they were so petrified. So we spoke about that yesterday. So uh, uh, I, there, 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 just two other points. What, what were they petrified about? So one, appro- one, one of the, the commentaries says that, that, that they saw there was a tzaddik in their midst and what they almost did to this tzaddik. They sold this tzaddik. That we had touched on yesterday. They went and they sold this tzaddik. But one of them, Forsham, says everybody should be petrified about that because we all have a potential tzaddik in our own midst. right? What about the tzaddik in our own midst? Right, that 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 we that we may have kidnapped, or not allowed to fulfill its potential. That each individual should be thinking about himself. That you know, hey, you know, there is more potential here. I could be using my time wisely. I could be doing be more productive. I could I could be doing fewer fewer naughty things. That that, that so so that's one of the things. The realization, Yosef, and what the brothers real about Yosef realize about Yosef. What they've done to Yosef is we have to realize it about ourselves. Look what, look what we. What we, what we sometimes do to ourselves if we sell ourselves short. You know, people have, people we have often more potential than we give ourselves credit for. And a person, uh, we are able to push a little bit more sometimes. You know, I always wondered, you know, in the Holocaust, there were Jews who did unbelievable things in the Holocaust. Uh, and, you know, a person thinks under those circumstances, gee, I, you know, I should never, we should never experience it. But I wonder if I would be able to, to, to sell my, 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 my meager portion of bread in order to be able to use a sitter for five minutes. Right, would I be able to do such a thing? You know, they, they, they're not so simple. Not so simple. There was once a, uh, a one of the rabbinim, I think the Kleisenberger Rebbe. Kleisenberger Rebbe went through everything. He lost a wife and uh, a wife and uh, eleven children. He was in Auschwitz. He was on the death march, and he was one of the people who, after the war, was able to get people together. And nobody could say to the Kleisenberger Rebbe, "Well, if you would have gone through what I went through, you know, you wouldn't be talking," because he went through it all. And then he started the Klosenberger Hasidus here in Eretz Yisrael. It was a tremendous Rebbe, Rebbe Huda Yukosil. Uh, Rebbe Huda Yukosil, uh, I forgot the last name. He was a tremendous, tremendous one of the Gedolei Ador. Tremendous Talmud Chacham and tremendous, just a, just a tremendous Oved Hashem. So he was once, after the war, they were in the, uh, you know, after the war ended, they were in the, what were those camps called? The, uh, where they gathered all the people together, the refugee camps. And at a certain point, they went to the Davin. So they asked, uh, he was getting a minion together. So there's an older man there. And he said to this older man, will you join us so we can make a minion? He says, I don't daven anymore. He says, why not? He says, I was in the barracks. And there was a guy in the barracks, one guy who had a sitter. And this guy would only let people use the sitter if they would trade a port their daily ration of 100 and 115 grams or whatever they got. If their daily ration of bread for the sitter, he would only let them use the sitter if they would give him their daily ration of bread. So if that's how a Jew could behave, I don't daven. So a Jew behaves with a sitter, I'm not going to be using a sitter. So the close of a Rebbe said, my friend, why are you looking at the one individual who traded the sitter for the bread? Why don't you look at all those other people who traded their bread for the sitter? Well, at that point, he went off and dove mincha with them. Right? <laughs> you, know, you know, there's always two sides to every coin. So, so we have potential, number one. Number two is the idea that the brothers are looking at him. Now, this is a guy. We kidnapped him. We sold him to a bunch of Midianites, Yishmaelim, this, that. Who, who knows? And they're looking at him. And never once did it cross their mind that this is the guy who could actually be the ruler of Egypt, that this ruler of Egypt is their brother. It never crossed their mind. That's a flaw. 
What was the flaw here? The flaw is that I'm thinking to myself, I never crossed my mind that HaKadosh Baruch could have done that. That means I, I, I came up short on God's abilities. That's a very subtle point. You're looking at this guy. Maybe you should have thought, you know, maybe that could be our brother. The last thing you're thinking of that could possibly be your brother. Why? Because there's no way our brother could have ended up the king. That right there is a flaw. You know, because Rojo could do anything under any circumstances at any time. It's not always, doesn't always happen that way. But there are, at, at their level, they should have, and that's what's oy lanu miyom hadin, oy lanu miyom hatochecha, that medrash we quoted yesterday. That a person has to live with, the, with an understanding that there are no, you can't, you can't put handcuffs on God. There are no limitations to what could happen. It never crossed your mind that that could be your brother. Right there is a flaw. It's unlikely, but right there is a flaw. There's a woman in America who won a million dollars on a scratch-off. And what an instant, an instant scratch-off. And six months later, she won another million dollars on an instant scratch-off. So they asked, I remember reading this, they asked, no, it wasn't me. They asked, no, it wasn't my wife. They asked, a, uh, they asked one of the heads of the lottery, what are the odds against that happening, that some, what same person should win it within that amount of time? However they calculate those odds. I remember it was somewhere in the 400 millions to one against. But it happened. It happened. You know, because, they, you know, that means take all the telephone books in the United States, stack all the telephone books in the United States together. There are 350 million people in the United States. And pick one, I'm thinking of one name, pick it out. One name in three, out of 350, those are your chances. The problem is that Kosh Baruch is not limited by chances. Kosh Baruch is not limited by odds. That's what they're blaming themselves for. It should have at least crossed our mind that that could have been our brother. And the fact that it was so, no, that can't be? Yes, it could be. Yes, it could be. I told you the story, these, these Kashrus supervisors from the United States they, you know, mashgichim, mashgichim of kashrus. So they go to, they went to Japan, and they had a, uh, they had a connecting flight in Japan, and uh, they get to the counter, and the lady says to them at the counter, in broken English, the lady, the Japanese lady, she says to them, "You have to pay another two hundred dollars for your connecting flight." So they said, "That's not true. We got the, the ticket goes all the way through. We paid the money already." But they start arguing. So she turns to her. She turns to her colleague at the desk and she curses them in Japanese. She mutters something in Japanese. So they realize they've been cursed. So these guys are tired. They're jet lagged. They're frustrated. So one of the guys, he shouldn't have said it, but he did. He turns to his colleague. He kind of makes a head gesture. And he says, She yamusu misa mishuna, which roughly means may they, dry, may they die a painful death, right? He was, you know, he shouldn't have said it, but he did. So as soon as he said it, she heard him. So she says, go to office. She points all the way down the corridor. Okay, they go, they go, they knock on the door. Come in. They enter the, there's a Japanese colonel sitting behind the desk. He says, what's the problem, gentlemen? Perfect English. He said, we paid for a ticket. She won't give us the budget, give them the hassle. He says, let me see your tickets. He takes the ticket, takes out his pen. He initials the tickets. He says, okay, you can get on the plane. It turned out his name was Shayamusu Misamshuna. When they said she yamusa misamishuna, when the guy said she was, she thought that they had protexia with the colonel, and she got all nervous. So she sent them to the colonel, and the colonel said, "The colonel, what he called Mr. Shayamusa misamshuna." Then went and he initialed the the what he called. Now, what did a lot? What's a, I heard that from the, uh, an Arab Godel told that story. Somebody said to me, "Is that story true?" I said, "Well, it's a. It's true that I heard it." Uh, B, and if it's not true, I would love to meet the guy who, who, who made it up and hang out, hang out with him. That sounds like a really good guy. You know, that, that's, a, that's the guy, there's going to be some action there. You know, Shayamoso Misamshuna, right? Uh, you know, it, 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 the, the unlikely happens in life. The unlikely happens in life. Every shidduch is unlikely. What's the likelihood of a shidduch? Yeah, I can tell you shidduch stories where, where the last thing in the world you would have expected was the shidduch. Right? Yeah, of course, Rocha wants a couple of people to get married. That's going to happen. It's the most unlikely thing in the world. You, know, you, know, you walk, a, you turn over a stone, and there she is. You know, you know, that's the last thing you were, you weren't expecting it. You know, there she is. Right? Okay, that's, that's number one. Number two, go to uh, a Pasuk Dalad now. Vayomer Yosef Elechov. Yosef says to his brothers, Gishuna Eli, approach me. Vayigoshu, 
So we said Rashi yesterday showed that he showed them the bris mila. Now, uh, we spoke about what that means, he showed them the bris mila. What's the idea here? What's the idea here? If you were Yosef's brothers, at this moment, what would, your, what would you be thinking? What's your, what, what would you be thinking when you meet your brother? I mean, let's say you were the guy who was sold by your brothers for 22 years. What would you be thinking about if you were the guy who was sold? I can't wait to meet these guys. Oh, there they are. <laughs> right. What's it going to be for them? Waterboarding, you know, watching television reruns. You know, what, what kind of torture am I going to put them through now, today? You know, that, that, that's what you... Yosef's brothers are obviously worried. At the moment that they see Yosef, they're obviously worried that Yosef is going to take revenge. You know, we don't know where this guy's holding. He's an Egyptian ruler right now, and he's been, he's, 22 years ago we sold him. What does bris mila indicate? Why do we do bris mila? Remember we spoke about a bris is on the eighth day. What does the number eight represent? Beyond nature. Meaning what? It's the, it's the idea that God is running the world, what we call hashkocha pratis. Remember the example we gave? I gave you the example when we learned about bris mila by Avram Avinu. That if you had a choice, if Avram Avinu was shown who the Jewish people are going to get through. They have to get through the Egyptians to survive. We have to get through the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Crusades, Chmelnitsky's massacres, the Nazis. What are the chances that the Jewish people would survive if you saw at the beginning of time what we're going to have to get through? Who would you bet on, the Jews or on the, on the field? Right? The field, of course. You're, there's no way you're going to... So how, the bris represents, when God gives the bris to Avram Avinu, and the bris obviously represents future generations because that's the organ of reproduction. He's showing Avram Avinu that in spite of the odds being stacked against you, the number eight, the bris which is done on the eighth day, means I will be supervising this with Hashgacha Pratis. So what's Yosef saying to the brothers? First thing he wants to say, guys, you got nothing to worry about. I'm not going to take revenge because I'm not blaming you. This is all manipulated by God. That's what the bris mila represents. So the idea of showing them the bris mila is to calm them down. The breathers are showing bris, the bris is to calm them down. Okay, number one. Number two, it's a fascinating, a fascinating approach here. What were the merits of the Jewish people that got them out of Egypt? I think one of them is they kept their Jewish names. Kept their names? Yeah. Their clothing? The language? And that they, well, Yosef is bris mila, and that they were not, they didn't speak Lashon Hara. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu was shocked when Dasan and Aviram, they threatened to snitch at him because the Jewish people were not a bunch of, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't a bunch of uh, informers. There was no Lashon Hara among the Jewish people. So there were really four things that were happening. So the commentaries say, Yosef is saying to them the following. Take a look at Pesach Dalad carefully. Vayomer Yosef Elechav, Ani Yosef, number one, I'm Yosef. I'm going by my name Yosef, not Safnas Paneach, which Paro gave me. Ha'oda v'chev, my father alive. Sorry, sorry, I'm reading the wrong Pesach. Pesach Dalet. Ve'yomer Yosef elachav, gishuna elav ve'gashu. Ve'yomer, ani Yosef, number one, my name. Achichem. Asher mechartem osi mitzrayma. I am Yosef, your brother. And, which, where is it? One second. Where does it say keep? Oh, it's later on. Sorry, sorry. Okay, skip that. Skip that. Skip that. Okay. Go to Posig go to Posig Memtat the Posig test. Skip that. Sorry. Um in Posig in Posig um tests. He then says, like the top of page 254. Sorry, sorry, we're going to come to that in a little while. In post uh, uh, top page 254. Maharu, hurry up. The Alu El Avi, go up to my father. Now, why does he say, go up to my father? Come down here, don't stay where you are. Take a look at Rashi. The Alu El Avi, Eretz Yisrael Gavo Mikola Arotzos, Rashi says. Eretz Yisrael is the highest land. And when we say about the highest land, it doesn't mean we're on page 254, top line in Rashi. Velua, Eretz Yisrael is the highest land. So we've mentioned that the height of something is always in the physical structure 
is an indication of the Ruchni structure. That's why the eyes, for example, are the most Ruchni part, the most spiritual part of the body. They're the highest part of the body, are the eyes. The lowest part is waste removal. Right? So high and low in the, in the, in, in the physical corresponds also to the, to the Ruchni. Eretz Yisrael is the highest land. Eretz Yisrael is the highest land. It's not only, it's no, no accent, by the way, that Sdom is the lowest point in Eretz Yisrael. Is it supposed to be the lowest point on earth or something? Death, the, 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 what do you call it? Uh, the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. There are people, there's actually a, 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 a pill, there's a, what do you call it? There's a, some sort of a monument over there that says lowest point on earth, right? And you have people, people actually pose and have pictures taken there. I'm not sure why you want to do that. Yes, this is the lowest point on earth, and I'm a low person. <laughs> I don't know exactly why you're taking a picture there. I would take a picture. I'd climb up an Amphitheater State Building, get a picture taken there before I took a picture in stone by the lowest point on earth. But it, there's no coincidence that's the lowest point on earth. That means that it spiritually is also the lowest point. Eretz Yisrael is the highest point. Yosef, earlier, when he told the brothers to go, he never said, go up to Eretz Yisrael. He just said, go get you, go back home, go back home. He never said, alu. Now he says, go up to my father. So this is the first part, we're going to see several messages that Yosef is sending to Yaakov to indicate that Yosef has maintained his own spiritual level. Because if you have a son who's been 22 years in the University of Las Vegas, and he's been away from home, you'd be concerned about his spiritual level right now. And if, you're, if, if Yosef comes back after 22 years of being alone in Egypt, so he's got to convince Yaakov Avinu that somehow he's maintained his spiritual level. The first is, go up to my father. In other words, they're going to communicate to Yaakov Avinu that Yosef said to us to go up. That means Yosef recognizes that Eretz Yisrael is higher than Mitzrayim. He never said it earlier because he didn't want to blow his cover. He didn't want them to know that he knows that Eretz Yisrael is a higher spiritually. And therefore, Yosef says to them, number one, it's going to be very subtle. Number one is go up to my father. Then he says, V'yashavta be'eretz Goshen, you will dwell in the land of Goshen, ve'isakora ve'la'atov v'nechu v'nechu you and your children, your grandchildren, v'tzomcho v'korcho v'kol ha'sher lach, you'll all be close to me. V'chilkalti yoschosham, I will support you. Ki od chomei shonim rov, there's another five years of famine. Pentivarish ato v'esho v'kol ha'sher lach, if you stay where you are, you're going to become impoverished. You're going to starve. And then in Pesach, you'd be, V'hinei nechem ro'os, ve'enei achi v'inyomin ki pi ha'medaber alechem. Your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Binyamin, that my mouth is speaking to you. Now what Yosef is saying over here, the commentaries say, there's a connection between the verbal abilities of a person and a person's reproductive abilities. That means... The area of morality and the mouth are connected. And there are people who could tell from the way a person talks, just from the way a person talks, Gedolim, people who are sensitive to Ruchnias, could tell from a person's speech what kind of behavior he, he what, what his moral behavior is like. More than that, a group of guys, this is unbelievable, a group of, a group of, uh, of, of, of guys, I think they were from Argentina, Bali Chuvas, they came in to speak to Rav Steinman, Zatzal. And after they, they walked out, they came to get a bracha from Rav Steinman, they were Bali Chuvas. And after they left, <laughs> Rav Steinman told one of, his, uh, uh, one of his attendants, he said, that one boy, call him, call him Ruvain, says, that boy Ruvain, tell him to come back. And Ruvain came back in, and Rav Steinman said to him, did you have a bris milah? And he said, no, he never had a bris milah. So he said, okay, you have to have a, you know, I have to raise your bal you have to have a bris milah. So I got, okay, so everybody's wondering, how did Rav Steinman know that this guy, I mean, he's looking, he's talking to the guy, how did you know he didn't have a bris milah? So Rav Steinman said, I knew. So they went to Rav Chaim Kinyevsky. They said to Rav Chaim Kinyevsky, Rav Steinman has Ruach HaKodesh. These guys were there talking, and Rosh Teman said, this guy doesn't have a bris milah. It must be Rosh HaKodesh. Shav Chaim said, it's not Rosh HaKodesh. He said, so how did he know? He said, people at that level, you can see it on somebody. But Rosh Chaim can ask you, so he said, it's not that, and he said, it's not that hard to tell. He said, at a certain level, when you're sensitive to Rosh so you can, you can pick it up on somebody. Don't ask me. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you. But that's what Rav I wasn't, the, that Rav Shtem, first of all, that doesn't mean it wasn't Ruach HaKodesh, by the way. But I'm just telling you, that the story is documented. And what, was amu- what I was amused by was Rav Chaim's reaction. His reaction was, yeah, that's, 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 uh, yeah, it's not so hard. Yeah, you could tell, if you could tell, there, there are those who could tell easily. It's not. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can tell if you have a beard or not. That, that I get, yeah, yeah, he's got, no, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm pretty good, right? <laughs> he could tell. They could tell. How could they tell? They could tell. Because you can feel it. You can feel it on people. What we call body language, we have a voice, of what we call, some you can see body language, person away, person sitting aggressively, they've got spiritual body language. Go figure. I mean, I guess if you, I guess if you learn Torah for 90 years uninterrupted, so certain things get a little easier to pick up, to discern. That's okay, number one. Then Yosef says something strange. In Pesach Yud Gimel, the Yigadatem Le'ovi is called Kvodi Ben Mitzrayim. Tell my father all my honor in Egypt, Veskol HaSherisim, everything you've seen, Umihartem Ve'oradatem is Ovi Heina. And quickly get my father to come down here. Uh, what's the obvious question here? What's the obvious question? Go home and tell my father all my honor and what you've seen and tell him to hurry up and come down here. Uh, well, what's the obvious question? Okay. He's giving them a message. He's telling, giving them a message. I mean, Yosef, haven't you learned? How did all this trouble start? With Yosef being the one who's honored. Now he's telling the brothers, go tell them about all my honor. Are well, you looking for trouble again? You got nothing else to talk to them about? That's what they should go, go report how honor, well, all the honor that I've got. Well, I got, <laughs> you got nothing better to do? Don't say straight. Yeah, that's not what's going on. Yosef wants Yaakov to come down to Mitzrayim. Yaakov is hesitant. He doesn't want to go live in Mitzrayim. He doesn't want to go with somebody, somebody invited my son. There's a kolo in Las Vegas. There is. There's a kolo in Las Vegas. There's a Kiruv organization in Las Vegas. I, between me and you, I'd rather be in a Kiruv organization in B'nai Brak than in Las Vegas. You know, they're doing good work over there. But, you know, it's Las Vegas. You know, I can think of better places in the world, like anywhere. Like, Afghanistan is a much more inviting than Las Vegas. Rattlesnakes and all. So, so, so you know, what, what, Yaakov Vino is going to Egypt. He just contaminated. He was the worst place on earth. Yosef is sending a message. It's not he's boasting about his honor. He's telling Yaakov Avinu, I'm in a situation where when the family comes down, I'll be able to supervise the family so that in Egypt, the family will maintain their Yiddishkeit level. That's what he's telling him. I'm in a position where, you know, it's not that he's boasting. What are you boasting about? He's actually not a boaster. He's saying, you don't have to worry about coming down here because the situation is ripe for the family. I could take care of you. I'll support you financially. But you're also justifiably concerned about the fact that, 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 what do you call it? That, that what's going to happen to us? What's going to ruch the in Mitzrayim? What's going to happen to us? The answer is, I'll supervise it. I'm in charge. I could make the arrangements necessary so that the Jewish people could then live in Egypt and I'll supervise them. Yosef's the ruler for 80 years. What do you think he was doing for 80 years? 80 years he's supervising the family and the, so that he's planting the seeds that the Jewish people should survive, not change their clothing. Their name. Where did they get that strength from? America, people came to America, within a generation they were using American names. Within American Asia. When people came to America from Europe, within a generation they were Steve, Mike, and Chris. Right? What, what happened? How did, language? They were still speaking Yiddish. All those years in England, in, in, in what do you call it? In Chicago, who spoke Yiddish in America? Yiddish, say people went to you, if you heard Yiddish on the street, they were embarrassed to be around you other Jews. They didn't change their clothing. In America they were wearing jeans. By the time they got off the boat, they were wearing blue jeans. Levi Strauss was a Jew. Yeah, yeah, of course. Levi Strauss, that's not an Italian name, my friend. It's not, it's not, it's not Levi Straussini, right? It, it, you know, Levi Straussini, okay, the Levi part ends with an I, ends with a vowel, so that you might have thought, Levi Straussini. No, 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 he's a Jew. Yeah, you know how he made his money? You know how he made his money? The gold rush. Started in the gold rush. When they all went out to, they all went out to San Francisco. So because they are not the, the they went in the 49ers. Why do you think they're called the 49ers, by the way? 1849. Yeah, 1849. Not because they scored, not because they beat the Bears 49 nothing. 
That's not why they call the 49ers. And the 76ers beat them 76 nothing. That's not why they call 49ers because of 1849 was the gold rush. So when the people went to go, they went to get rich on the gold rush. So one out of 100 got rich digging for gold. Ha. Ah. But the Jewish guy wasn't going to get his get 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 his get his hands dirty. So what did the Jewish guy did? He produced clothing so that when these guys are in the ground digging for gold, he produced the material that wasn't going to rip easily called jeans. Right? And he became the richest of them all. <laughs> it's like the agent, like the sports agent. He doesn't want to get the Jewish guy doesn't want to get sweated up, run around, run around in shorts. He wears a three-piece suit, makes more money than any of the guys he's signing out of the contract. <laughs> then he becomes an owner of the team and makes even more money. So, so what do you go? Yosef is saying, I'll, I'll be able, I'll, I'll be able, I'll be able to supervise over here. I'm, I, you know, I got, yeah. So you said they kept uh, language clothing. Uh, language uh, clothing, uh, language uh, clothing names. Name. And I, and like, where did they get that? Where, where, where did that? What, what, what gave them the? What do you call it? The. Uh, the, the strength to hold it for all the 210 years. What fortified them? Yosef's supervision in the first 80 years is what fortified them. He maintained, he made sure, hey guys, got to have a minion, got to get up for minion, guys. Yosef was running around, he was the vecker. You know, he may have, you know, built shoals or whatever it was. That was what he was going to tell Yaakovino here. Was it just that Yosef has said, say, ha ha, tell daddy how rich I am. So what, what does that mean? It's in order to show that you don't have to worry coming out. Yeah, Mayor, good. But also that means that with time, uh, like there's only a few things that will actually stay strong, and like, like it does imply a, a lower. Of course, they did. It said they got to the 49th level of spiritual yeah. impurity. They're surrounded by idol worship. They're still there to listen. It's working against you. Look at a deeper level. I'll tell you what really you, you know in, in the um, that's one of the it's one of the paradoxes over here, and this is one of the questions. How do the two coexist? On the one hand. They're praised for keeping their names, their language, and their, and, and, their, and their clothing. On the other hand, they reached the 49th level of Tuma. What does that mean? I, I mean, either, they're, either they were great or they were terrible. What, what, what happened? I heard a fascinating answer once. You see, it, it, why, is it, why is it that in Israel, there are a lot of Israelis in Israel who leave, secular Israelis, they leave Israel, and then they become Bali Chuvas in, in, in Chutzlarts. It's an interesting phenomenon. They go to Germany, they go to Canada, they go to... And all of a sudden you find that you go there and you're going to find a lot of Israeli Balchuvas. And in Israel, where you have Arachim, and you have, uh, you have Or Sameach, you have a, that they never got involved with. How did that happen? They went to Chutzlars. So they're, they're, one of the... Uh, look, this isn't a... It's not, it's not, it's not a... It's not a... Way to go, it's, not a, it's not a piece of Gomorrah, but it's a speculation. The speculation is that in Israel, they have something of a Jewish identity. They speak Hebrew. They probably go to Shul on Yom Kippur. They have a Pesach Seder. They eat sunflower seeds. You know, they say, say Yalla Bai. You know, you, know you, got, you, got, you got a very much a strong Israeli, you have, an Israeli, you have an Israeli identity which touches on a Jewish identity. What happens is, when you go live in West Germany, or you go live in Canada, you're surrounded by non-Jews, they're Canadians, they're Germans. They're very German. They're very Canadian. If you go to France, they're very Muslim. But you, they're very, they're, they're very German, right? And, and, and when, back when things were normal, each country had a very, very strong national identity. And all of a sudden, the Israeli drops in there. And well, they know they're Germans. They know they're Dutch. Who am I? So you start searching. In Israel, you don't need to search because you know who you are. That means sometimes a little bit works against you. So the Jews in Egypt, they hold on to their names, they hold on to their language, they held on to their clothing. But it didn't, and by the way, and they were also told, one day there's going to be a redeemer. Right? You really believe that? You believe there's going to be a redeemer? I want to ask a question. Do you believe the Mashiach is going to come? Yes, you believe. We all believe, oh, we all believe Mashiach. Who doesn't believe Mashiach? When you checked the news this morning, when you, went, when you opened up your, your smartphone, were you looking to see, is there any news of a Mashiach sighting? Why not? Why not? I, think, I would think that's more significant than how many buildings got bombed in Gaza. As much as we want to see buildings get bombed in Gaza, I'd really like to see one news item, sighting of Mashiach. 
How come nobody's studying? Look, 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 geez, I got up in the morning. First thing I got to see is what happened to Warzo. Why well, know first thing in the morning? Did Mashiach come or not? No, still no. When you're waiting at a bus stop, you believe the bus is going to come? How many times do you look at the check? When you look up at the time on the thing, you know, four minutes to the bus. So you know you got at least 12 minutes. Sometimes you wish these bus things would time the rest of your life. Because four really means 12, you know, that, that sort of thing. And you're looking at, why? Because you really believe, you know, we, of course we believe that she's going to come. But there's belief and there's belief. The Jewish people, they believe there's going to be a redemption. But you're sunk into a situation of complacency. Yeah, I got my name, five of us machta yid, you know. And you, and you got your, what do you call You got your hat, you got your, your jacket, and you go to davening. What kind of davening was it in Mitzrayim? When, when you're being whipped and you're being good, you're, on a, you're, you're sure, a very Jewish, but we're on the 49th level. We're, we're almost, we've come to terms with the fact that this is where we're going to be, and we're basically going through the davening. And I'm done. And then Moshe Rabbeinu shows up. Do you know there's a medrash, there's a source that said when Moshe Rabbeinu showed up eventually, he said, Pakot Pakarati. Moshe Rabbeinu showed up, then he left for 12, six months. He disappeared for six months. You ever hear that? There's a source. I never found the source. There's a source that says he showed up, he said, I'm here, and then he left for six months. What do you think the Jews looked like during that six-month period? Do you think when they got up in the morning? What do you think? Up until that point, were they asking about, hey, did you see a Redeemer? Just like we, we ask about Mashiach nowadays. What about during that six months, once Moshe Rabbeinu showed up and they see he's the Redeemer? What do you think it looked like the next morning? Anybody see a Redeemer this morning? Does anybody see Moshe Rabbeinu? I think I saw, no, no, this is Brother Aaron. They look very much alike. No, no. All of a sudden, you you're, you're woke up, pulled you out of your complacency. So, so you could be Jewish, but you're very, you're, you're very complacent about your Jewish. You're like an Israeli living in Israel, secular Israel. Yeah, I'm Jewish. I like Hanukkah, I ate Sifganiyot. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish. But there's nothing in your Judaism. And all of a sudden, the Mashiach shows up. Let me ask you a question. What do you think davening looked like during those six months that Moshe Rabbeinu was there? If Mashiach would show up and then he would leave, see in six months, fellas, what do you think our davening would look like? What do you think our, our entire, that's what happens, that's how you, the, the two coexist. You could be on the 49th level, of, you could be very, very Jewish and you're on the 49th level of, of impurity. Because you're flat, your, your service, our avodah Hashem is completely flat. That's what, that's what happened over there. Okay, now, Yaakov, Yosef embraces his brothers, and then take a look at Pasuk Yedalad. Vayinashek lecholef, vayipol al tzavrei binyamin achiv, he embraces binyamin, vayevk, he cries, u binyamin bocha al tzavarov, and binyamin cried on his neck. They fell on each other's neck, they, they embraced each other, and they cried. Take a look at Rashi and Pasuk Yedalad. Um, by Yipol, it's a right column, three lines from the bottom. By Yipol, al tzavare b'yom inochi v'yevk. He cried. Al shnei mikdoshos she'asidim liyos b'chalko shal b'yom in v'sof anecharev. Why did he cry on Binyamin's necks? Plural. Tzavare is necks, plural. Because he was thinking about the two base of mikdoshos. Binyamin, the base of mikdoshos was built in Binyamin's portion. Yosef was thinking about the two base of Mikdashas that are built in Binyamin's heart, they're going to be destroyed. So he's crying for the two base of Mikdashas. U Binyamin bocha al tzavorov, which is singular, al mishkan shilo. The mishkan, which was in shilo, she osid lios bechelko shel Yosef v'sofa the is going to be destroyed. So they were crying for the future. So there are two questions here. Two questions here. Question number one, is, you know, two brothers haven't seen each other for 22 years. What do you think you'd be crying? What we call nowadays, what do we call it nowadays? Tears of joy. They're tears of joy. Which sounds like a contradiction in terms. Tears of joy. Right? So we have to understand what tears of joy really are. Number one. So you'd expect two brothers from the same mother, you know, they, they, they expect to see these tears of joy. And instead, Yosef's crying because he's thinking about Two base of Mikdashas that are going to be destroyed in Binyamin's portion. And Binyamin's crying because of a Mishkan that's going to be destroyed in Yosef's portion. So first of all, why are they crying about the future at all? Why aren't they crying about the present? And number two, 
if you're crying about the future, why is he crying about Binyamin's base of Midoshes? You cry about your Mishkan and he'll cry about his base of Midoshes. Why is there cross crying over here? Two questions. So there's a standard answer. Anybody got an idea? What's the standard answer? Why are they cross crying? You know what he said, Jake? That the Jews cry for each other, not for themselves. Good. Why should Jews cry for each other? Why should you just cry to each other? You're good. You're on the way. Why should you just cry for each other? Why were they separated? Why was the base of being just destroyed? The second base of being at least. Why was the second base of being destroyed? See, it's clean and baseless hatred. What's the, what, what separated the brothers over here? Baseless hatred. Their hatred of Yosef is what separated them for 22 years. What's the rectification for baseless hatred? Where does hatred come from? Hatred comes from when I'm thinking about me and you're thinking about you, then there's going to be animosity. If I'm thinking about you and you're thinking about me, then that's exactly what Jake said. They're cross-crying because that's really the cure for sin chinam. The cure for baseless hatred is concern for each other. So Yosef is crying for Binyamin's base of Mikdash. Binyamin's crying for Yosef's Mishkan. Because that ultimately is the cure for the baseless hatred, which is what sent us into exile after the second base of Mikdash. Number one. Very good. Number two, let's understand what tears of joy are. Tears of, they're tears of joy. Tears of joy. I once heard about a woman, a woman can, went to a wedding. You know, at weddings, everybody's always crying at weddings. Everybody always cries at the wedding, especially the photographer, because he's getting jostled around. Everybody cries at a wedding. So, so, so I heard once a wedding, there's a woman, the mother of the bride, and some lady comes over, she says, wow, you look so lovely. And this woman bursts into tears, but they were bitter tears. The woman didn't know what she said, you know, she, she complimented her, and the woman also, she starts crying, and she's really crying. She said, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm sorry if I offend you, I just said you look wonderful. She said, I'm not crying because of that, I'm crying because of the first compliment I've received in 35 years. That's a bad story. Yeah, yeah. That means that means there's a husband there. There's a there there's a husband over there that needs to get potched. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. That's a bad story. So the I once heard of Victor Miller once told a story. A woman was on her deathbed. She had a miserable husband, just mistreated her her whole life. She was on her deathbed, and the husband said to his wife right before he died, he said, "Please, you know, I know I, I haven't been a great husband. I just, I just before you died, I just ask forgiveness. I know I've been really bad." And she looked at him and she said. I'm sorry, I cannot forgive you. Then she died. That's not something a guy wants to hear. Right? Yeah, yeah, bad, very bad, very bad. So why am I telling you this? I'm not sure. So the, uh, the what do you call it? The, the, so, oh yeah, we're talking about tears of joy. So when, t you know what, a tears, there, there are two explanations. One's a, a basic explanation, one's a deeper explanation. Tears of joy are not happy tears. Those tears, what we call tears of joy, if it's joyful, you should be laughing, not crying. If I won the lottery, I'd be laughing. I wouldn't be crying. No tears of joy. I would be laughing. Why are the tears of joy? Be when a person thinks about, at the moment of the joy, then a person thinks about all the hardship he endured till he got to this point that created the tears of joy. When, 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 when two people haven't seen each other for a long time and they're crying, they're crying because at that moment there's some sort of connection to what caused the separation to begin with, the suffering that went through the separation. They were separated for so long. That's what the tears of joy are. Tears of joy are because all of that suffering bursts out. But it's more than that. And this connects to the base of Migdash. The base of Migdash was the source of all joy in the world. Mesos kol ha'aretz. It's the source of all the joy, the Pasuk says. When the base of Migdash was destroyed, so then a whole bunch of sadness came down to the world. Spiritually, sadness descended. So when a person really experiences something happy, we have our happiness is mixed with all sorts of spots and, 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 and periods of unhappiness, because that's what life is. There are periods of good, there are periods where it's not so good. So you have moments of happiness, but those moments of happiness are also all over the place. There are those moments of unhappiness. When you experience a major moment of happiness, major happiness, a reunion, a winning about, your happiness spills over into those regions of unhappiness. In those regions of unhappiness that are encroaching on the happiness, that's what creates the tears. 
That's where the tears of that's what the comment is. And that's why they're crying about the base of Migdash now. That's why they're thinking about the base of Migdash. We have our moment of happiness, Yosef. But these moments of happiness when this base of Migdash is destroyed in the future, these types of moments of unhappiness of happiness are going to be tamped, they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be uh, tempered down by those moments of, of, of unhappiness. And that's where the tears are really coming from. That's what the Mephoshim say. It's a fascinating thing. It doesn't make any sense. What are you crying about? What are you crying about? You should be, you should be just laughing and rolling over. And we don't. We, there are tears. And the more, the more, the joy, why are you so happy? You know, you know parents who marry off a kid. So if it's a regular kid, or regular, it's like that. And they marry off a kid who had trouble getting married. They finally married off this kid. The parents are, the parents are, I just had a father last night who told me he married off his last, his last child. And he told me he was there. I wasn't at the, I, I, I was at the wedding. I didn't see the chuppah. He said he was crying at the chuppah because it was his last child. So he was crying. Why are you crying? You should be happy. Got the last one out of the house. You know, what, 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 what are you crying about? The answer is, yeah, but every, all the, all the, because this is really the culmination of raising the child, of raising your children. Raising it, you know, there's an expression called Tsar Gidel Bunin. Do you ever hear that expression? Tsar Gidel Bunin? The difficulty of raising children. So this expression out of the Gemara. It's called Tsar Gidel Bunin. The, the, the torment of raising children, the difficulty of raising children. Children are difficult. It starts when they're young. You got to get up at two in the morning. You got a baby. You got to get up at two in the morning. And wake up your wife to take care of the baby. It's not so easy. <laughs> no, yeah. Then, then you got to pay tuitions. And you got to deal with teenage daughters and their emotions. Not so easy. Then you got to pay for this and marry him off and hope he doesn't, the boys don't get arrested. You know, you know, it's not so easy. So you married off the last one. I, finished, I completed the job. The tears are when. You, you completed the job. Yeah, it was just, it was just, it was just a, a, what do you call it? Just a, just a walk in the park, huh? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And so there's tears. There's that sadness comes in. The, the difficulty, that's what's mixed in with it. Okay? Now, the, um, uh, um, in Pasuk, in Pasuk Tesvav, I'll tell you a very subtle point. Vayinashek lechol echav, Yosef kisses all his brothers. Vayef kaleim, and he cries. Now, literally, the word aleim means it cries over them. Then his brothers spoke to him. Very, very, what, what's going on here? He kissed them, then he cried, and then they spoke to him. What, 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 what's happening? They don't cry. And it doesn't say they cried. So, right, it doesn't say they cried. So, first of all, um, um, what do you call it? It's, I thought it said earlier they did. One second. Didn't it say? No, at no point does it say they cried. That's interesting. At no point does it say they cried. Maybe a little later. I'm not sure. Huh, interesting. Interesting. You have to check that. But over here, it, it seems like three separate things are happening. He kissed them. He cried. And then they spoke to him. So Rashi says... That, that, what do you call it, that then they spoke to him because they saw that if he's crying, you can't fake tears. Unless you're a professional actor. You really can't fake tears. So at the point that he's crying, when he kisses them, they see that he really, he really, yeah, you know, I mean, you can fake a kiss. You can fake a kiss. There's even the mafia had something called a kiss of death. Right? You kiss the guy before he's about to get, before they, before they what do you call it, him, before they strangled him, you kiss them goodbye. Right? If you ever saw the Godfather, right? You know, first you give him the kiss. That's the, that's the kiss goodbye. Then, then then they take the thing and they, what was it called? That they they uh, there's a word for it when they put the put the thing over and they strangled it. It was a mafia standard. By way. it was a potential career choice for me, but I forgot what the <laughs> what. It's a good part also. So the the uh, the what do you call it? So they they the gar- I think it's called they guarded him. I think that was what it was called. Whatever it is, you can fake a kiss. You can't fake the cry. When the brothers see, he kisses them and he cries. So now they realize that he really is sincere about forgiving them, and therefore they talk to him. That's the plain meaning. That's what Rashi says. But there's also over here a bit of a, the dreams. They see that there's been a fulfillment of the dreams. Now, what they're thinking is, well, we prostrated ourselves to him, and if we prostrate ourselves, then that means we accepted him as the master. That means we're slaves. We are his slaves. 
Slaves don't talk in front of the master. You stand there quietly till the master speaks to you. Yosef wanted to show them, no, you're not my slaves, you're my brothers. It was a one-off. When you bowed down to me, that was all that was, that was the fulfillment of the dream. That wasn't mean you're going to be a permanent slave or servitude to me. How does he demonstrate that? He demonstrates that by hugging them, by kissing them. I'm not your master, I'm your brother. And therefore, they talk to him. Because now they realize he's telling us we're not permanent slaves. That was a one-off. Now we have permission to speak. And therefore, they, they speak. Okay, we'll see tomorrow what Yosef sends to Yaakov.